What up, everyone? Welcome to another edition of Outside Shots. I am Saul Bookman. This is Eddie Johnson. Thank you all for joining us on this lovely Thursday morning. Yeah. Uh, it is It is Masters Week, Eddie. Are you excited about that? Yeah, I've been up this morning already, you know, peeking in. You know, I got the little Masters app, you know, yeah. and just go ahead That's and clean, just take care of it. That's a clean app. It's really easy to use. It's really smooth. You can go to yeah. the holes and the players. I really like it a lot. Yeah, I'm FaceTiming you right now. Why are you FaceTiming me right now? Well, okay. I have no well. idea. Hold up. Let me let me adjust my chair. I'm I'm looking a little <laughs> tall right now. <clears throat> uh so EJ, you know, you're in LA. Um, you know, I, I've heard you on the broadcast from time to time. And yesterday I, I heard a couple little snippets. Uh if it sounds like it's it's not that you're frustrated. It just sounds like you're you're a little disappointed with you know obviously the lack of play as we all are, right? Um, the lack of high level play and you know yesterday at, at a certain point you mentioned the phrase you know pride, and you know I'm looking at this team they're battling for a sixth spot so that way they don't have to play in the play in, um, and man if they didn't lay such a big egg not only uh, in the in the loss on Tuesday, but last night also, it just felt like a chore, you know, until the, the last, the waning minutes of the game where they, they finally pulled away. I've never thought that a double digit victory would feel, um, so unsatisfying, if you will. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I, I think when you have high expectations, uh, of individuals and players, it's like, you know, it's it's hard to, you know, you're looking at a, thinking it's going to be a Picasso and it turns out to be a drawing that Saul Bookman wrote or, or tried to draw, <laughs> draw you know? Hey, you don't want like, that, I promise you. <laughs> yeah, you know, I can't draw either, to tell you the truth. So, yeah, it, that that's the part. And, you know, people over the years, they they always want to critique, like critique me on a broadcast and, and, you know, they always have their comments and they're having their comments as they're sitting in their family room. They're sitting in their little man cave. They got their little drink. Uh, they're very, like, relaxed. Whereas you're critiquing somebody that actually has to talk to thousands of people and try to say the right thing. Uh, that's not easy. Uh, and so what I've learned over my years since I started broadcasting is I can't be fake. Like when, if I'm fake, then it will come through the screen. And I didn't, I didn't, I haven't lived my life like that. Like I have to be honest and sometimes it doesn't sound right. Sometimes it might sound critical uh, and then it, sometimes it might sound homerish, which I don't consider myself a homer at all, but I know I have to be balanced. Mm -hmm. And that's the most difficult part about broadcasting. Uh, you know, <clears throat> for me right now, I started this game of broadcasting. I was a neophyte right out of the league, you know, and really having to learn on the fly. And I've been doing this for over 25 years, and now I, I believe I have a Ph.D. in it. But the only way you're good at it is you have to be balanced, you have to be fair, you have to be honest, and you have to not be afraid to say the right thing, man, that you're seeing on TV. It's not radio. See, on radio, you can kind of embellish and you don't show the correct picture. But on TV, they're, they're watching. Like, how can I ignore energy? How can I ignore uh, confidence going down to a low level? People on the television that's watching it, they see it. 
And and so now you have to develop words to be able to say it, but don't be as critical as you, you know, probably want to be if you're at home sitting on your couch. If you're using, uh, you know, you kind of you used a couple key words there, and I, you know, I, I'm I'm a, I'm gonna take you, I'm gonna take everybody to the from the known to the unknown, okay? You know, EJ, you're using those words about like you know accountability and, and you know and, and not being fake and um, you know n- knowing your audience and sometimes the truth hurts, and I feel like feel like. <laughs> Uh, there's been a perspective from a lot of fans um, and media alike that have looked at this team and feel like there's not, there might not be a person in that locker room that is not a coach that is doing the same thing, holding guys accountable, uh, you know, telling guys the ugly truth from time to time, right? Um, I don't know if that's happening or not, right? And I'm not going to speculate that it is or it isn't because, you know, I don't know. But I will say this. Following the the loss against the Clippers, uh, and it was one of the ugliest losses you could possibly think of. Um, the you know the vibes in that locker room were very very low. They were very bad. They were not good. Um, and some of the sp- the the talking points afterwards were not great. You know you you have Devin Booker talking about you know chilling. You know as they head into the next game. Um, you have Kevin Durant kind of, you know, he, you could tell he was a little bit irritated, um, frustrated, if you will. And when Kellen Olsen asked him, you know, who's, you know, what's the leadership in the team like, you know, who's stepping up, who's saying that is, is anybody holding accountable Durant kind of, you know, at first he kind of pushed back and, and kind of tested Kellen Olsen on that. And then finally he kind of gave in and, and kind of, you know, talked about we win and we lose as a team. And I just feel like, I just, you know, listen, if it was any other team, I would tell you a million times over that things are disconnected. They're they're not flying at a very high level right now um, at the most unideal time. And it's very, very hard to put this all together when you have the superstars that you have. And I think people mistake superstars for great leadership. And that's not always the case. And I'm not saying that Devin Booker, Kevin Durant, or Bradley Beal are not exemplifying leadership skills. But I, what I will say is, is that uh, when you see a team as fragmented as this on the court, there's got to be something behind the scenes that is going on. <clears throat> and the chemistry is at an all time low, in my opinion. Yeah. You know, Saul, the season is a long season, man. And I look back on my 17 years and I cannot believe that I played that many years and really 18, the, the eight, the, the year over in, in, in Europe was extremely hard. Uh, just playing in that environment, going two a days for eight, nine months with young guys. I'm 35 years old. Like I don't, I look back on my career and I, like I said, I've been open and honest on our podcast and talking about, uh, well, some points in time I had depression. Uh, I went through my injuries, uh, went through my knee injury that really put me down below, uh, Played when I played for Cotton, he would play me three straight games and three straight nights of 48 minutes. I mean, all I could do is go home and go to bed. Uh, just dealing with family issues do, during my career, uh, having kids, all of that, worrying about them, changing the transition. It's so many things that an athlete goes through. And then you have the 82 game marathon, it can kind of tax you. And so you're going to have this roller coaster ride. You really are. Like, the Boston Celtics has had a tremendous year this season. They've won a ton of games. But if you look back on their season, they still had stretches of criticism. They still had stretches where they look like, you know, yeah, they're winning, but, man, people would criticize them, whether it's them taking a ton of threes, uh, whether it's Tatum having a meltdown in a game, whether it's Joe Mazzula not calling timeout. Like, even in the greatness of their season, you still had an opportunity to criticize them. And the only reason I'm saying this is because I will I will protect the Suns in this instance, that they haven't been whole all year. Like, we've had really small stretches of them really having their team core together to be able to show us what they can do. 
And I think because of that, it has been a roller coaster ride for them, without a doubt. And it was really topsy turvy. And what I mean by that is the one guy that you would probably not want to have to play all the games would have been Kevin Durant. You would rather that had been Devin or Brad, not Kevin. And you see now during this course of the year that Kevin's kind of fatiguing. Yeah. And so, you know, it's all in the middle, the middle part of that even makes it worse. Guys are just hoping the season's almost over. This is a unique season in that it is going to the very end. Rarely does a season go to the very end. Mm -hmm. Normally at the end of the season, teams are resting players, getting ready for the playoffs. They've been solidified in their position. Not this year. Boston is the really the only team you can say that had that done that over the last month. Everybody else that got to go down, Denver, Oklahoma City, and Minnesota, they got to go down to Sunday. That game we're going to play against Minnesota on Sunday is going to really mean something for them. Yeah. So that's part of it right now, and I think we are seeing it with our team, is that the roller coaster ride of the season, the disconnectness that we have because guys haven't been playing together over a long period of time, uh, shows itself. Yeah. And and so now we can't say woe is me. We just got to find a way to complete the process and and get that sixth position and get our butt but into the playoffs and don't worry about who we're going to play uh but just get in and not have to deal with a play in game. EJ, I'm going to have you either adjust your mic or unplug it and plug it back in or something cuz there's some popping going on on your end. Really? <clears throat> yeah. Oh, no. it stopped. It stopped. Oh, it stopped now? Yeah, keep talking. Okay. Testing one, two, three. Yeah, it's it's still popping when you talk. Oh, know. really? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, but oh. while EJ tries to fix that, uh, let me tell you that that the good folks at OGs have got you covered. This show is presented to you by the good folks at OGs, and OGs is the best edible in the game. Go check out their RSOs, their Indicas, the Sativas, uh, or their March or their Edible Madness uh, champion, the Sleepy Time Gummy, which is fantastic. You can't go wrong with that. Uh, go to any dispensary you can find to find the best edibles in OGs by going to ogsbrands.com. Look at their uh, their dispensary lookup, and it'll tell you the closest one to your neighborhood. So go check it out. All right. Um, you know, obviously, you know, we can go on and on and on and on about the Suns and, and their, their lack of uh, chemistry issues, the things that they've had to battle throughout the years. But, you know, EJ, I would say this, too. A, a lot of teams have to go through that kind of stuff. You know, yeah. It's not just these guys. Now, granted, now, not a lot of teams. Me? Do you hear me now? I can hear you now, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, all not right, a lot of, not, not a lot of teams have to battle um not only incorporating new players but incorporating new players a new system a new head coach and all the above right so it is difficult and I will give them that but at the same time these guys have played over 32 games together um you you get to a certain point where you're just like they are just what they are and right now for my estimation and listen folks I, one of the things I will never do is, is I'm not going to set up Eddie for failure. Not that he couldn't handle it, but I'm not going to sit here and and force him to a answer questions that are going to put him in trouble with the team. I'm just not going to do that. But what I will say, I will say is, is that this is a disconnected team from top to bottom. And it is, it felt like that at various points in the season. I kept thinking that we were going to overcome this at some point. And like the very best of this team, is going to show itself as we get to the playoffs. And it looked like it was happening last week. You know, they had, they had beat, uh, you know, three out of four games that they had played were against some of the top teams in the East and the West. Like, they were grooving. And they get to Sunday, and even Sunday's loss, you know, I, I could deal with it. You know, when Zion's playing out of his mind in the fourth quarter and doing what he does, like, hey, you're good with that. And, you know, it's, it's a good loss if there was such thing as a good loss because when you get to Tuesday, that's a bad loss. The way you went down, the – the the reaction being down 35 to 4 as a professional basketball team with Kevin Durant, Bradley Beal and Devin Booker on it is just out of my mind I can't even believe it. I just can't believe it and I won't accept it. And that's 
that's just negligence on the highest level, in my opinion. Um, as we move forward, obviously the vibes were something else, you know, the, the mood around the team and EJ, I would love for you to talk about how the mood was last night after the game with the players, as you guys headed to the bus and got on the flight to Sacramento and all this stuff, like how, how were guys feeling? Were they feeling a little bit better than they were the day before? I assume they would just a little bit. Um, but you know, with, I, I assume they also were not satisfied with their performance dis- despite the fact that, you know, the Clippers did not have any stars playing last night. As a matter of fact, they doubled down on their lack of stardom by pulling Paul George for last night's game. And they still were in the game until the very end. So I, I just, I don't know what the vibe is on that team right not, now. Well, EJ? well, not, not only Paul George, they didn't have Russell Westbrook. They didn't have mm-hmm. Zubac. Terrence Mann played eight minutes, didn't play him anymore. They didn't have Kawhi Leonard. They didn't have their team. The guys that they played with last night were guys that won't even play come playoff time, Uh, will get limited minutes uh, on the floor. Now, it says two things. It says, one, about their development of players, but it also, to me, it echoes and it reverberates something I always say. To Suns fans doing telecast, I'll say to fans that listen to my radio show on Sirius XM NBA Radio 4 to 7 every day, I continually tell them there is no buster in the NBA. Like, there is no buster in the NBA. You look down at the end of an NBA bench and fans tend to look at a guy and think he can't play. If he can't play, he wouldn't be in a uniform. They all can play. They're just not getting the chance to play. But when given the chance, you will see what Bones Highland can do at 37. Like, you see what Boston can do at, like, 23, 24. Like, you will see that guys can play. And so the fact that they said all those guys alarm me because I know that guys want to prove themselves and they're going to compete, but also know – you can play well the first three quarters and then true to colors and true to how it always plays out. When the game gets tight in the fourth quarter, that's when you realize, okay, that's why that guy's not playing yet. Yeah. And they couldn't make a shot. And so, so I I felt like doing the game, I, I knew that would probably happen, but I was disappointed in us not putting them away. Again, that was a grand opportunity to put them away and allow guys on our bench to come out and play. And I've always protected role players in my career because I was a role player after my first six years. And that is the time for you, the starter, to put a team away, give maximum effort, and then allow these guys to come finish the job and get a chance to be on the court. And that didn't happen last night, and that disappointed me. It truly did. Like, Devin KD and Bradley Bill should not have had to play that many minutes. Uh, and that's probably the part that I'm just really like, you know, up and down about is the understanding of what to do when you're in a position to do it. And I think we struggled with that. And not only in that situation, but also saw in our decision making. Like, uh, look, I'm not sitting here like acting like I'm uh, Pistol Pete Baravich or John Stockton, but I will tell you that one of the values, the you know, people used to get on my defense and all that, and I felt like I defended at an average level, okay? I was an offensive player. And so most of my my job description was to score. But in, in, in the realm of me scoring, I considered myself an above-average passer. I wasn't fancy. I wasn't a fancy passer. But I was a passer. Like, when the ball left my hand, it went to the hands of my teammates. I didn't turn it over a lot. And I made the right passes. Mm -hmm. If you were a post guy and you weren't posting up strong enough, and I'm not throwing you the ball. And I would tell my teammates, like, hey, man, you got to post up better. Because I'm not going to throw it in there. I'm not getting the turnover. Or if I'm trying to throw a pass to a teammate on the perimeter, and I'm going to tell them, I'm like, look, man, you got to give me a V cut. You got to give me an L cut. You got to hold your guy off. You got to put your hand up to send me the signal that you're ready for the ball because I'm not going to assume that you're ready to catch the ball. You got to give me a signal. And if you don't, 
I was taught to look somewhere else. And I used to tick teammates off with that, but I felt like I was taught that way, right? Throw it into the post. I'm not going to throw a lazy pass. I'm going to take a dribble right, dribble left. To do what? Get the best angle to throw it in. We don't do that on a consistent basis. Yeah. We just throw the ball. Like, we just pick the one, the turnover Brad Bill had at the end. I don't know if maybe he thought the guy was invisible. He didn't see him. It was in the short corner. He just threw it right to the guy. Yeah. Like, and I'm saying, hold up. You know, and so it's those type of things that drive me nuts. And that can't happen, man, come playoffs. Yeah. That just cannot happen. And so that part right there is what gets me. And their mood and all of how they're looking and how they feel, it's hard to read guys now. And, and I'm not ripping on them for that. You know, everybody's different in their own way. I went through a period of my life where I was an extremely quiet guy. I truly was. I know it's hard for you to believe that or anybody that listens to me. I, I was extremely quiet. Uh, I didn't say much. And it drove my wife crazy because she felt I was losing out on opportunities to be able to market myself and all of that because I was so quiet. You know, I was talkative around my teammates, but outwardly I was not that talkative. And and even today I'll sink back into that if I'm in an environment where I don't know people or, you know, know them well. You will see that part of me. I think at the Christmas party that you had. Yeah. Like, that's normally me. Like, I'm just really low-key. And, and so I was really bad as a player and i had to learn man to talk these guys don't talk and it's just a part of the the environment just the, just how players are today and i think when you don't do that it, it creates a disconnectedness on the court and this is like in general this is not just the sons it's mm -hmm. every everybody that plays sports now I don't know. Maybe it's the phones. Maybe it's just, the, you know, the communication now is electronically or what have you. It's just it's kind of disturbing. There's a lot. There's a lot of levels to that one. Uh, we can we could probably talk about that all day on another show for sure. Um, Eddie, you still got some popping going on. I think you got some wires maybe that are touching from your mic to maybe uh, uh, maybe a power cord or something like that. But every time hmm. you talk, it it's it's buzzing. Wow. Again. But, um, Okay. It, it, listen, I, I would I would say I, I totally agree with you in that perspective. And man, when you talk about you want to talk about a trigger, when you talk about passing, oh my goodness! Uh, I just I just want to say this real quick. I don't understand the idea or the thought process of a player, a mm -hmm. star player, in an opposite corner trying to throw a cross court pass for no reason to Royce O'Neal on the opposite side of the floor yeah over over five defenders and and really there was no defender that was not out of position so why make that right. pass it, like those are the types of things that you just you want to pull your hair out i don't understand it uh we have a couple super chats uh cycle blue with a ten dollar super chat saying being 14 games over 500 has never been so miserable <laughs> I mean, hey i will say this it has not been a fun season um you know i think as suns fans we have We've been spoiled by good basketball, um, you know, especially in the last two or three years. Before that, um, yeah, the, the decade was tough, but we had some spots there, and, you know, and it, it wasn't as miserable. I mean, listen, 19 wins isn't great, but it's not terrible when you're talking about the mm -hmm. future of the team when you had Mikhail and DA and Book. You had, to, you had a future of promise. So then before that, obviously, seven seconds or less fun times and before that obviously the Barkley era and stuff like that so like we've been spoiled by good basketball for sure um the thing that I think fans get really irritated about is uninspired basketball the effort you know the the mental lapses um I'm watching players when they turn the ball over just walk back like they don't give a shit and that's not okay that's just not okay on any level and 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 I will say that I would say that to anybody's face right now Eddie, if you did something on this show over and over again that I was just like, why do you keep doing that? That is not okay. Like after the show, I would tell you like that. That's no different than anything else. And you would tell me too. I mean, you're always telling me that I'm late when I'm here like five minutes before you are. So like you definitely would tell me. So I, I just don't understand where this team is mentally. And I think that's the most concerning part. And the, and the biggest thing, and I've said this on Tuesday, this team lacks an identity. 
It absolutely lacks an identity. And you, there's no way to go about that because when Chris Paul was here, they had somewhat of an identity uh, along with Monty Williams, especially defensively. You know, that was the thing that, you know, Monty really preached and he really, and, and there was a type of player that Monty really, really liked. Um, this team, I don't know what it is. I don't know what, what is it supposed to be? They're supposed to be this offensive juggernaut or are they supposed to be, you know, this offensive juggernaut that's also good at defense. Um, but sometimes they're not the offensive juggernaut when you score four points in 10 minutes of a game uh, with two minutes left to go in the first quarter. So then what are you going to hang your hat on? Well, it wasn't the effort. It wasn't the defense. It wasn't anything. So what are we, what are the Phoenix Suns? And I think that's the most frustrating part. Got some more super chats, Cedric Phillips, $5 super chat. Honestly, it's Frank. It has always been. Even Eddie said yesterday, let's get to the rim. There's no offensive scheming, iso ball screens, and threes. That's all it is. And then he sent another one, $5. Thank you, Cedric. Uh, Suns, down se- sound- Suns down by seven versus the Clippers with Beal driving. They leave that GP to uh, to shoot threes or that game plan to shoot threes. How do you not put Bowl in that situation, post up, get get uh, and, and draw the foul? Um, I, man. Last night, when you were talking about the the offensive scheme, I, I don't know where to go with that because uh, I don't understand when you have no Zubac, you have basically no interior, and you just were just chucking up threes, man. Just chucking up threes, man. Like, what are we? I it, it was almost. You tell me if I'm wrong, Eddie. It almost felt like they were chucking up the threes to prove a point about analytics. That's how it felt to me. They're like, oh, yeah? You want us to shoot nothing but threes? Here you go. I don't know what to think about that. Well, they won, they won a pace last night for about 80 threes. Yes. Uh, and, yeah, I was – you know, it's almost like this is a battle when, when you're, like, psychologically thrown off kilter. Like the Suns, those players didn't think that they would show up in L.A. and all of a sudden the whole entire Clipper team wasn't playing. Like that's a mental hit, right? And so now it's like, oh, come on, we playing, really? Like we're going to take the shortcut. What's the shortcut? Shortcut is taking a three. Yeah. Like they always talk about pace of play. Uh, well, the three enhances really the shortcut because what it is, you're just running from three-point line to three-point line. That's it. You're not running 94 feet. And so you're saving energy without a doubt, especially if you're not attacking offensive boards if somebody takes a three from the other side. So it was almost like it was a back-to-back. It's almost like, oh, we can beat them by just taking threes. Mm-hmm. And and I know Frank would like for them to take more threes at times, and at times this year they have not. Uh, and so, yeah, they beat the Clippers last night by taking a ton of threes, right? No way that happens against a very good team on the floor, and you do that, right? So they knew that they could not have to go full bore and beat this team. It just took a long time to do it because Bones Highland and Boston were playing well. And and so, yeah, they got caught up in that. The second half, they came out, and they kind of calmed it down, right? So they kind of started attacking. Devin started attacking. Bill started attacking. Uh, KD went back to the mid-range. So to me, it was almost like they were working on their threes. Because let's face it, on Tuesday, if Gray- Grayson Allen's never going to struggle from three like he has the last few games, right? So if Grayson Allen makes a couple of those threes yeah. on Tuesday. Yeah, they win. We come back and win that game. So I think in a way they were like, you know, in a sense, working on their shots too, you know. And so it didn't look pretty to us. uh, But I kind of felt that, you know, we would wisen up and get the job done in the fourth quarter. And we did. But, yeah, that was a ton of threes, man. That, that, That was, if you're making them fine, but when you're not, we're a team that is probably arguably the best mid-range team in the league. Mm-hmm. So you go to your, you go to that and knowing that you can balance it all. And that's what I was hoping would happen, but it took three quarters to do it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, EJ, can you see our chat, our private chat? Uh, oh, our producer is trying to talk to you in our private chat. Oh, um, no, I, I don't. Okay. Well, hold it. Well, let me, let me hold it. Let me open it up. <laughs> 
this is live on air. Some uh, technical assistance for our man EJ because we still hear the popping. We're going to try and get that solved. Um, but if you can see yeah. the chat, just uh, you can you can see what he's saying. Uh, while he does that, folks, let me tell you about Four Peaks. Four Peaks, uh, obviously one of the best craft brews in the state, if not the best. I would say they were the best. They got the wild wheat, the the peach ale, which is my favorite, uh, and they got that nice juicy ale from bad birdie a nice collab that you can get anywhere in the valley you should go check it out and uh listen if you've never been to their h street pub you are missing out it is fantastic you got the kill lifter you got the sun's brew uh it, it's all delicious stuff h street pub has food too you can go out there you can check it out you can eat all their delicious food and they also have uh a seasonal menu which is terrific so in the summer, you're not going to get like hot soups and stuff like that. But in the winter, you will. So that's that's great. So uh, check them out and make sure that you are over the age of 21 to enjoy. And please enjoy responsibly. Uh, you know, before mm -hmm. we wrap up the show, we got a couple things. First, uh, Eddie, I mean, the women's game is just on another level right now. Uh, and I know Caitlin Clark got a lot of the love and deservedly so. And I think she brought a lot of attention to the women's game. And I think a yes. lot of people watch those games and realize, you know what? This is really good basketball. And I've been missing out because I thought whatever your, your expectations were. I've been watching women's basketball basically my whole life. I coached high school women's basketball. Uh, one of the best experiences I've ever had. I've coached military men. I've coached girls high school basketball. Coaching those girls was far much funner than 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 coaching the men in the military why uh because you know what the the they they want to learn and they wanted to do it the right way that's the thing exactly when, when i was when i was coaching military guys they had their own way they thought they always knew best and they wouldn't listen to shit and so you had to like you basically had to out alpha them to prove your point which is just like it's exhausting with the with the with the women, it was like, hey, this is why you're doing this. And as long as you coach the why, and I always preach that, you always got to coach the why because the more a player knows, man or woman, uh, about why they are doing certain things in a game, they will they will execute it to the best of their ability because they understand what the ultimate purpose is. Um, so while you make a move that you think is insignificant, that move ended up having a chain reaction to another player to get them open in the game, right? And if you coach that that way, then then they'll understand, right? And that's that was my favorite experience. So watching these women absolutely ball out, uh, the games that were going on during the tournament were fantastic. The Final Four <coughs> was, was was amazing. I really loved everything. That that Iowa UConn game, all the way to the last to the very end when that offensive that offensive foul was called. It was it was great basketball. Like it was just really really good. It was really fun. I just really appreciated it. And then before I get to you, Don Staley, uh, just an amazing coach. Uh, I I love her demeanor. I love the way she approaches the game. I love her mindset and you know the fact that she got on that podium, not only praised her team but also praised and recognized what Caitlin Clark had done for the game as well. Um, and and now the WNBA is taking over in terms of promoting all the games that Caitlin Clark's going to play in <laughs> the Indiana fever right now, before even drafting Caitlin Clark, which everybody knows is going to happen because they got the number one pick have already had every game except for two uh, already slated for national television. So that should tell you everything you need to know about where the women's game is at, especially Caitlin Clark. Um, I'm excited for the season, Eddie, your perspective on the women's game, 18.3 million viewers, which was more than the men's, national championship by far it wasn't even close um and you had two number ones going at each other uh, in that game so i mean just fantastic all the way across the board well a home run for women's sports in general uh they've had to fight the battle over all these years to be relevant and be respected and the way that they're doing it is they're playing the game the right way that's why like People watch it because the purity of the game really, I think, just jumps out of the screen in how they actually play the game of basketball. Uh, like when they run a play, they run, they go through every option of a play. 
like every play that you run, believe it or not, has about two or three options. Like when I played in the 80s, played for Cotton, we had like four or five options on a play. And he would make sure that we would get to at least three of them. 24-second shot clock doesn't allow you to go more deeply than that. But, yeah, I mean, like, that's the beautiful part of the game. Like, when when we in the 80s, we always compare ourselves to basketball today. People don't understand when we do criticize today, we just talk about the purity of the game, the execution of the game, and how beautiful the game is when you do it. The women do that. Like, they execute to the highest level. And that's what makes people fall for them and love them because of the way that they play. And it's just amazing watching them do it. And so for me, you know, I really grabbed hold of it when I was calling Mercury games, uh, when I was, you know, left for two years uh, traveling with the Mercury and and calling games, man. I, I just loved it because I could actually break the game down. I had time to just go through different things that were done to really help teach the viewer you know, so one, they can teach their kids or if kids are watching to understand that's how you should grow up playing the game. And uh, so, yeah, I, I loved it. I, I think, you know, women's basketball is taking off. I hope it continues to grow uh, without a doubt. And uh, hopefully the men will take heed to that and watch it uh, because you can always learn something from each other. Uh, and women don't play with a ton of athleticism. They're not dribbling and attacking the rim like Anthony Edwards and dunking over people and, and jumping. No, they have to basically play on the floor, and that's why their game is beautiful because they know they have to set a good screen. They have to come off a screen perfectly, right, and read the screen. You know, player goes under, you, you know, you, you pop back. You know, player chases you, you curl. Like, all those things they do because athleticism is not going to dominate their game. You know, we don't see a woman come a woman come in and she has tremendous athleticism that just wows you. No, no, it's normally on the floor and how you play. So, yeah, I, I love it. I, I love the fact that it's grown and it's going to continue to grow uh, in that regard. And. You know, the thing I'll just say about Caitlin Clark and, you know, obviously when you're great, you're going to be polarizing now. Like when you when you when you consider a great basketball player, then the normal thing for people to do is to tear you down. Like they start to nitpick. You know why? Because they don't want to see great. They they get envious when they see somebody that's just out of this world. They want to find ways to say, oh, see, no, she's not that no, look at her. She's not that good because they're on their couch. They just don't work out. And I'm just being kind of funny on top of it. And they don't, they get envious of somebody doing something that they know they can't do. And so they nitpick and they try to find different entities of why they're not right. And we see it historically in our country. Our country is the worst at it. Uh, we, we turn on people that are tremendous. Uh, and what they do, because we have a certain agenda that we just need to tear them down. And that's the part that drives me nuts. And Caitlin Clark, you know, is in the middle of that. Uh, Don Staley. I mean, it just doesn't matter. Like, people want to criticize people instead of enjoying what's in front of them. But she's going to get it, man. She's going to face it when she gets to the WNBA. She's got a, a whole ton of women waiting on her oh yeah she has no idea she might think she does she has no idea i mean every night she is going to be wanted but guess what when people start saying you're the goat when before you become the goat and people start saying that put you up here that means you're going to get attacked go ask michael jordan go ask lebron go ask larry bird go ask kareem Go ask uh, Cynthia Cooper. Go ask Cheryl Miller. Go ask Donna Taurasi. Like, that's how it is. And uh, Taurasi got ripped. She got ridiculed for something she said. But I understood what she meant. She meant, like, you know what? We'll see. Like, we'll see when she gets to our level. If she's the, if she's the goal, we'll see. 
and, and and they're waiting on it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll just a reminder, if you're going to be a dick in the chat, you're going to get booted. That's just how it is. So if uh, you want to come at me, go ahead and try. It ain't going to happen. Uh, not today, not tomorrow, not ever. Uh, we don't need people why don't coming you invite in here. Him, why don't you invite them to a boxing ring? Well, being I mean, being why, trolls like, over invite here. Them. To, invite them to a boxing ring. You take talk, care of them in the ring. First of all, you know, listen, I don't know where these people come from. I don't know who they are. They got these weird-ass names. Like, I invented gravel as their headline. They don't have a profile picture. They don't put their name behind their image. Like fake tough is what that is. It's just internet troll tough. And like, I'm not here for it. Uh, and nobody else should be subjected to it. We're here to to share in our love of uh, not only the Suns, but also sports in general. So uh, kick rocks if you uh, come in with a bad attitude. Uh, also, Cycle Blue with a super chat. EJ, how much does the city's fan base factor into players going to teams? Suns players have called out bad arena energy a few times now this season. Is that something that can hinder the market? No, not really. I think our city is growing to a crazy level. Uh, we love our basketball, but we're very uh, opinionated, and, and rightly so. I mean, basketball has been in Phoenix for a long time, and we've had some some great teams. I won't say great because you got to win a championship to be great. But we've had some very good teams. We've had some, some tremendous players, uh, and – no, this city has become very educated on basketball. Uh, and I try to do my part to educate people. But no, I think they have a right to boo. They have a right to be disgusted. Uh, they pay their money to watch the game. Uh, those players receive that money. So this is the entertainment business too. So if they feel like you're not giving them what they want, they have a right to be upset. Now, not belligerent not start, you know, getting personal, but they have a right with body language. Uh, they have a right with a boo every now and then. I uh, have no issue with that. Yeah, I think the Suns fans have a pretty good vibe in terms of like when to turn it on, when to turn it off. They're not going to reward a team for lackluster play, I'll tell you that much. Um, but at the same time, I have seen other other fan bases understand the moment and understand when your team needs to get picked up. And I think that's maybe what the the – the, that comment was referring to uh, the anonymous Buddha with uh, 200 rupees. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, EJ, please give your unfiltered personal opinion as if he would do anything else. Uh, do you feel the Suns players play without heart? If so, why is that? It feels as if every team other than the Suns plays harder and with more passion. Well, I think we're more like, you know, you have different types of teams, right? So you have a physical team, you have a finesse team. I think we're a finesse team, but that doesn't mean that we're, we're not physical and don't fight. Uh, but I think we lean more toward the finesse aspect of basketball, which can be devastating, and we've seen it. But the effort behind that finesse has to be there. And what I mean by it is you still got to, you know, like a lot of people say, well, you know, you got to really work hard. You got no. It's not about working hard. It's about working smart. and like, if anything, like when you say energy, play harder, what, what does play harder mean? Like, play harder, most people think, oh, diving on the floor and being physical and knocking people down and jumping up. No, no, that's not all about just playing harder. Playing harder is also a part of slash smarter, which means take an extra dribble to get a better angle. Run the court wide. Don't run close together if you got a fast break. Uh, turn around and block out your man, even though you might not get the rebound, but just go block out. If the ball's on the floor, first man on the floor normally gets the ball. Yeah, it's those types of things that you need to have incorporated in your team. You don't have to be some big, strong guy going around knocking people down, but it's just playing smarter and harder at the same time. And, you know, the Suns, if they're going to make any kind of headway through the playoffs, they're going to have to lift that up and, and, and do that. Uh, you have some players that are, that's their job. Like Nurkic, that's his job. Eubanks, when he comes in, that's his job. Royce O'Neal, that's his job. They're there to protect our what? Our Corvettes. Who are our Corvettes? KD, Devin, and Brad. Like, they're doing the hard part. They got to put that orange ball in the rim. They get all, they get the best defensive player guarding them. So it's that combination of a team that, takes you to that level to win 
You know, Cycle Cycle <coughs> had a great comment right here. He said, "Everyone talks about the results being inconsistent with this team. In my opinion, it's the inconsistent effort that makes them inconsistent. Um, and that is the root cause of this. And and, and listen, I, I can't disagree. I, I do think that there's been times where the effort hasn't hasn't matched." Um, you know, the the intensity of the game at certain times. And, you know, I think everybody's got their own perspectives on that. Bobby Cox with a $10 super chat. Uh-oh. Guys, I'm upset that some star players are not playing like last season. It, it It's happened the last two weeks. Play if you're not hurt. Oh, I have a scratch on my finger. I can't play. Really? Grow up. I, I don't know what that's referring to I, yeah I mean, bradley beal not, like damn near dislocated his finger and he still played like so yeah. i don't i don't really understand nurkic, that. nurkic is playing on a bad ankle uh i think devin's foot is bothering him somewhat uh uh grayson allen dealing with a hip issue yeah uh <clears throat> so this time of the year you're gonna be battling certain little things uh the one thing i won't say is is our players like skip games because of of an of a, a hurt that they that they're dealing with? No, I would not put that on them. I think they all love to play basketball, uh, but so you can criticize them on certain other aspects of it, but not that. Psycho Hawk two thousand said, "I think Bobby was talking about other team stars sitting out, like the Clippers last night." Okay, I could see that. Yeah, well, I could see that. Yeah, but the Clippers pretty much, I think, they're solidified, not all the way. That, that kind of shocked me that they didn't uh, play them because it's not like, you know, they see what Dallas is doing right now, and if Dallas gets home court advantage on them, I don't know what the setup is for them to get it. But if they do, that's not that's not good for the Clippers. But obviously it's a reason Ty Lu set all those guys out. Like, I'm not thinking that he just did that to do it. I think it's a reason he did it. Uh, James Harden obviously dealing with something right now, and you you can you got to be careful with him. He's an older player. Kawhi, we know the history of that, right? Last year, I mean, he was killing us in the first few games, and all of a sudden didn't play the rest of the series. Uh, so no, I, I think what Ty Lue decided to do yesterday was probably right for his team, and it was good for the Suns. Like, I mean, hey, we'll take it. I mean, you know, so you, you take the victory and now you got to go to Sacramento. We're going to leave here in a couple of hours and and uh, try to get a game against them, which is going to be a, a big time playoff game uh, against the Kings without a doubt. Yeah, no doubt. Before we do wrap up, I do want to get to uh, your opinion on one thing that happened yesterday. It looks very, very likely that the Arizona Coyotes are going to end up moving to Salt Lake City at the conclusion of this city or uh, this season, which is very unfortunate. Uh, Eddie, you've been in the valley ever since the ever since the um, the coyotes got here. You know a lot about them. You know a lot about their history here and how tumultuous it has been. Um, but I will say this, uh, learning more and more about this franchise in the last six years, um, I will say undoubtedly that while they might not be as vast as the Suns fans and Cardinals fans and stuff like that, they are just if just as if not more passionate than any other fan base I've ever come across, especially considering the the 500 yards of crap that they've had to deal with during their entire existence here in the Valley. And it's really unfortunate to see yeah. if this does come to fruition and they do move to Salt Lake City. It's just a really sad, sad time for a lot of fans here in the Valley. Well, it's tough. I mean, I think what they, they initially started, America West, and it and America West wasn't, you know, it was America West time. And it wasn't really conducive to hockey, a lot of blind spots. Uh, they get an opportunity to move to Glendale, uh, which if you haven't ever been to that arena, that's a beautiful arena. I don't know what they're going to do with that arena. Like, why would they let them go? I don't understand the financial stuff about that, uh, but... I mean, what are, what are they doing over at that arena? I mean, uh, what, they, they just have concerts? They're just sitting there? I mean, they, like. They said that they can make more revenue off of concerts than they could Coyotes games, which is not bad. Yeah. That, that just, that's, that's amazing to me. Uh, when you got guaranteed, what, 80 plus games over there. Uh, but I thought it was, I, thought, I think it's a tremendous facility. And then, you know, having an opportunity maybe to move into Scottsdale or Tempe or whatever at, yeah, that kind of that shocks me. That that that, that kind of shocks me, and uh, I think we'll pay a price. Uh, history tells you that you pay a price when you allow an organization to move from your city. You know, Seattle paid a price. 
without a doubt. Uh, Charlotte paid a price, but then legal, you know, felt, you know, that they should give them another franchise and they did. Uh, so you, you don't want to lose a team, man. That, that, that to me is, that's suicide. And, and, and that's, that's, that's disheartening, uh, that they're going to be moving. Yeah, it is very sad. Uh, hopefully that doesn't happen, but um, we appreciate everybody and your comments out here in, in the chat. We appreciate you all being respectful and asking some really, really great questions today. Um, if you didn't catch the beginning of the show, uh, you can, you can, you know, like Colton Dodd asked, what do the Suns need to get back on, on to the top? You know, Eddie you kind of referred to what things need to change a little bit at, at the beginning of the show. So you can go back and check that out. Uh, in the meantime, uh, you can come back next week, 830 as always. Uh, that's Eddie Johnson. You can follow him at Jump Shot 8 on Twitter and on Instagram. You can follow me at Saul underscore Bookman uh, on both platforms as well. And you can follow the show at PHNX Suns, PHNX underscore Suns. Uh, tomorrow night, we will be doing a watch party out at Gila River. Please come out, enjoy some drinks, and uh, have a good time, and watch the and Suns. Li- listen to EJ, and you and listen to EJ. We do have him on the loudspeaker. Uh, oh, do you? Yeah, we do. Yeah, we you always me up loud. You learn a pipe, lot. We, we, always, we always pipe in the sound for you, man. Learn always. it, learn it, learn it a lot from me, huh? Yeah, that's good. <laughs> we appreciate you all taking the time this morning to uh, watch the show. Until next time, we love y'all. Peace. Yeah, I don't I don't know. Y'all silly like the mayor.